Thanks. So this is part of a, a larger project that, as Breck says, looks at sound, which is why I'm here. Um, but I'm interested in the way sound is understood in the, the long 19th century, really, uh, when sound was first measured and graphed, um, when it was first understood that it moved in waves. Um, and this, this moment interests me, and I, I trace it across different cultural forms and media and look at the effect it had on literature and on <clears throat> the general imagination. I'm quite interested in ideas of what happens beyond what you can hear. Um, so I look at things like animals who can hear sounds that humans can't. Um, and I'm going down an interesting thread at the moment with spiritualism and listening to sounds that aren't there and so on. Um, but today I thought I'd talk about something more medical uh, and look at uh, an object that was invented in my time period 201 years ago, uh, <clears throat> which is the stethoscope. Um, and I'm quite interested in this in terms of new sounds that were being discovered and the way they were described, and then the stories that were told about them in literature. So, as I said, it was 201 years ago in 1816. Uh, this young French physician called René Lenec was struggling to examine a patient in his hospital in central Paris. The patient in question was an obese young girl who was presenting with symptoms of heart disease. Uh, so this posed a number of technical and social challenges for Lenec. He had three options uh, available to him at the time as to how he could diagnose her. So first thing, he could just ask her a series of questions about how she felt uh, her family's health, uh, the degree of pain she was experiencing. This is obviously an important part of medical consultation and doctors still do it today. Uh, secondly, he might employ a technique that was known as percussion, which is using the hands and fingers to tap on the body and listen to the sounds to hear whether they're healthy or unhealthy. Uh, this is also a technique that's still used today if you go to the doctor. Uh, and his third option was simply to press his ear up against her chest and hear what he could hear. Uh, which was a common practice at the time, but in this case did pose problems of pressing your head against a young girl's chest uh, in 1816. Uh, and his patient was obese, so he probably wouldn't have heard very much uh, in any case, uh, in terms of the sounds being emitted. So <clears throat> this was a medical, a social, and a technical challenge. Uh, and so the story goes, Lynette writes in his memoirs afterwards, that this moment he recalled the basic principle of acoustics, that sounds grow louder when they pass through solid bodies as opposed to being transmitted through the air. So he rolled up a piece of cardboard, put one end at his patient's chest, another at his ear, and he thus created the first stethoscope. And this is it. Uh, so he's pleased to discover that he could hear the actions of his patient's heart far more clearly than he had ever uh, been able to before. Uh, and his imagination was immediately seized by the possibilities of this new auditory technique. It's known as mediate auscultation. Auscultation means listening, mediate, because there's a mediating object uh, involved. So for several years, he experimented with a range of woods and metals to work out the best materials to use to hear his patient's heartbeats. Uh, and this is the model he originally settled on. Uh, so as you'll see immediately, it's monaural. Uh, binaural stethoscopes weren't invented until later in the century. Uh, and it did undergo almost immediate modifications, but this was his favourite. Uh, it was, this one's cedar, it's about 12 inches long, it's very bulky, and it's not all flexible, so you have to move the patient rather than the instrument. He originally called it just a cylinder, but then changed it to stethoscope, which comes from the Greek stethos meaning chest, uh, and scopian meaning to view. So immediately we have an interesting linguistic phenomenon here of, of seeing a sound of viewing your patient's chest uh, through the ear. Uh, and throughout, I've just put a lot of different pictures of um, stethoscopes so you can see the variations and models uh, that were involved in the time period. Um, but the advent of the stethoscope was a clinical, uh, sorry, was an integral component in the burgeoning field of clinical diagnosis. Uh, and indeed, by the end of the 19th century, and probably still today, it is the symbol of modern medical it was a creative solution to a practical problem, and it did have far-reaching consequences. So it was a material, visible conduit between doctor and patient that granted access to an auditory realm beyond the usual sensory thresholds, and it thereby had the potential to extend 
the boundaries and range of the human ear, uh, but also of medical knowledge itself. So it was a means of knowing, understanding, and diagnosing the human body through the medium of sound. But uh, the new soundscape that Lenek had made accessible through the application of his cylinder was a very strange microcosm of unique sonic objects which overlay one another in a confusion of unrelated noise. The human body is inharmonious and internally cacophonous, and its various creaks, crackles, roars, rattles, hisses, and fizzes do not signify anything in and of themselves. Uh, and to illustrate this point, I'm just going to play a quick video, um, sorry, audio, of these are breath sounds, so it's lung sounds rather than heart. Um, and just to bear in mind, this is a modern stethoscope. So for the, about the first 50 years, there would have been much more of a reverberation in the instrument uh, to contend with. to construct any kind of meaning, medical or otherwise, from this, uh, you have to first learn to identify the sounds that you can hear, um, made whether by the heart or the lungs, to notice any blockages that are present, any peculiarities, and to distinguish them from any other unrelated sounds that are always present in the body. Um, those sounds have to be defined, differentiated, and correlated with the physical lesions that are found in the body during autopsy. This was not just an auditory process. He had to literally listen to the sounds, wait till his patients died, open them up, and then say, okay, that's what caused the sound. Um, and it was in this way that Lynette gradually developed this language to describe as precisely as possible each of the diagnostic sounds that were emanating from his patients' bodies, and then to assign to each a specific pathology. This led in 1819 to the publication of a 900-page treatise on the art of stethoscopy, and it has a medical meta-language uh, and although it's intended to provide an independently verifiable objective framework of acoustic signals representing pathological phenomena, it in fact draws upon and is mediated by highly subjective metaphors, musical experiences, and the broader cultural imaginary. So I would argue that art and science, language and the auditory were from the outset intimately intertwined in the development of the stethoscope. Lenek himself admitted to his struggles to transform auditory experiences into meaningful linguistic phenomena that he could then teach to his students as well. He noted, for example, the five different kinds of rail, which is a rattle that's made uh, on the inhalation of a diseased person in the lungs, uh, that I often lack words to express them. Uh, the language that he used to describe each type of rattle was both striking and inventive. And he continually resorted to metaphors that were of his own subjective creation. These range from, and these are quotes, uh, the noise of the carriage on the pavement, which is emitted by the mucus or gurgling rattle. These, these are the descriptions of all the sounds you've just heard. Uh, the metallic tinkling of the dry crepitus rattle, which he says bore a striking resemblance to that emitted by a cup of metal, glass or porcelain when gently struck with a pin. Uh, and the flat, grave sound of the dry, sonorous rattle, which at times allegedly resembled the snoring of a person asleep, uh, at other times the friction on a bass string, and occasionally the cooing of the wood pigeon. Um, so you'll see, if you think back to the recording, where the difficulty lies, trying to match what you've just heard with those descriptions, uh, and then diagnose a patient accordingly. Uh, throughout his study, though, Lenek does turn to the sounds of animals, musical instruments, craft workers and the general soundscape of the parish streets for linguistic inspiration and he conflates scientific phenomenon with poetic metaphor in order to make sense of what he's hearing and in order to find a way to replicate it for others. 
uh, it has been noted that from his youth, Lynette read music. Uh, he sang, he played the flute, he had private dancing lessons, apparently it was terrible. Uh, and these experiences undoubtedly provided a rich auditory framework with which to approach this problem. So the strange crackles and hisses uh, that are transmitted through the stethoscope obviously do not conform at all to early 19th century constructions of Western music or harmony. Nonetheless, Lenek had recourse to musical sounds, to instruments and systems of notation throughout his investigations, and this facilitated his methods of diagnosis. It, it provided more easily grasped material analogies in order to locate and communicate sound when, in his own words, words seemed to fail him. So the use of musical metaphors throughout the next treatise effectively treats similar, familiar sound-producing objects and instruments, such as bells, whistles, drums, chimes, harps, vibrating strings, uh, as stand-ins for the human body and its organs. In his descriptions of the propagation of vocal resonance along the bronchial passages, he alludes to the difference between the sound of a hunter's horn and the drone of the bagpipes. Uh, elsewhere, he compares flattened bronchi to the reed of the bassoon or the oboe. And in his account of an increased loudness in the lungs, he engages in a long, three-page long discussion of the German flute. So this was an approach that allowed the musical world to supplement the much more abstract auditory experience of listening to the body, and it provided also a tangible method of representing those sounds. So in his revised treatise of 1826, he describes a case in which there's a weak but distinct bellow sound, he calls it, uh, in the carotid artery of a female patient. He says it ascends and descends on three notes, almost constituting a major third, except that the upper notes slightly flat. Uh, but he perceives the sound as a kind of tune, or as a melody, uh, and in his own words, he calls it the sound of a musical instrument executing a rather monotonous tone in the shrill tones of a Jew's harp. Uh, and he used musical notation to record the experience. Lenek had a very, very good ear. Um, he does note that nobody else present in the room could hear anything at all in his patient's neck. Um, so they really just didn't know what he was talking about. But um, musical reference points did come readily to his mind to describe what he was hearing and it afforded him a means of orientation in this new sonic realm. And his musical representation of this murmur, while it didn't entirely obviate the potential for subjective interpretations, does provide a material trace that can be replicated in the days before cardiograms and so on. Um, I would argue it provided a context for comparison and it is in many ways a precursor to the emergence of medical technologies later in the century like the sphygmograph. Uh, that displayed the different internal motions of the sound by various graphic methods. When in 1821, the Scottish physician John Forbes spent a year translating uh, his uh, Lenox treatise from French into English, he included a short preface that, despite his own intense labours of translation, openly recognised the stethoscope's practical, social and professional challenges. He insists that none will, take, one will regret, none will regret the great pains taken to master it, but he concedes that the difficulty of attaining any kind of knowledge of auscultation is one of the greatest drawbacks of his value. And he mentions certain physicians who report they've tried the stethoscope and just abandoned it altogether uh, on finding it deceptive or useless. Such was the difficulty in learning to use the instrument that he says that he doubts will ever come into general use. Uh, in his 1846 lecture on the heart, the British uh, heart doctor Peter Neal Latham betrayed a similar anxiety in transforming a sensory experience into what he considered an imprecise, uh, highly subjective linguistic phenomenon. He insists that the sounds which naturally accompany the healthy heart can only be learnt by listening to them. Uh, and in his words, it is therefore useless to describe them. This is in his lecture to medical students at King's. Um, he argues that all medical students must simply be their own instructors. The auscultator must learn through practice to become attuned to the various pitches of the body's organs uh, and must employ great perseverance in doing so. Uh, the very real <clears throat> dangers of misunderstanding and misattributing the roars and buzzes proceeding from one stethoscope were presented far more satirically and in a different mode uh, by the American poet and physician Oliver Wendell Holmes. Holmes had studied in the medical schools in Paris before graduating from Harvard Medical School, and he's one of the first Americans who was trained uh, in the 
expert in the new clinical method. His comic poem, The Stethoscope Song, a professional ballad in 1848, is, as its dual title suggests, at once a somewhat lyrical tale about a physician and his stethoscope, and a narrative representation of the dreadful song or sequence of sounds that the instrument emits. The opening stanzas describe how a spider crawls into the shiny new stethoscope of this bright young man from Boston town, uh, who's recently returned from his studies in Paris. And the spider at once sets about spinning a web, which catches several flies who set up an annoying buzzing inside the instrument. And so the unsuspecting physician then mistakes this buzzing for the sounds of his patient's hearts. Uh, and his overzealous treatments lead to many mis misdiagnosed ailments uh, and also bring about several deaths. It's a very long poem. Uh, <laughs> in one desperate case, however, uh, he intervenes in order to show his school by auscultating the patient's chest. And it says, then out his stethoscope he took and on it placed his curious ear. Mon Dieu, he said with a knowing look, why, here's a sound that's mighty queer. The bourdonment is very clear, amphoric buzzing as I'm alive. Five doctors took their turn to hear, amphoric buzzing, said all five. <laughs> There's emphema beyond a doubt, will plunge a trap or in his side. The diagnosis was made out, they tapped the patient, so he died. Uh, finally, when the young doctor insists that six young damsels, slight and frail, uh, whom he visits, are suffering from a grave disease, which will soon be fatal, and then they survive. Uh, he's, he's proven to be a fool and he's aghast. Uh, and they're driven to implement material changes in the design of the stethoscope uh, so that this won't happen again. Uh, but we're left with a quite a stern warning for such a funny poem, uh, not to rely exclusively upon our ears. And um, he says, now use your ears all that you can, but don't forget to use your eyes, or you may be cheated like this young man by a couple of silly abnormal flies. <laughs> So the material and environmental conditions uh, of a stethoscopic examination are critical to a successful diagnosis, uh, and they can quickly become impediments to medical procedures. It's a very funny poem, but it's symptomatic of a kind of professional anxiety at, at the time about looking like a fool uh, for using this newfangled instrument from Paris that some doctors were still extremely skeptical of. And there's also a longer tradition of um, patients being frightened when they see an instrument because it was traditionally associated with surgery, and there were several incidents where patients saw a stethoscope and thought they were going to cut open. So there were other longer medical issues as well. But what then we may ask uh, of the ramifications of this shift in listening for the increasingly objectified patient who's now profoundly aware of and yet unable to access the sounds that are emanating from within their own bodies. Uh, and if they can, they don't know what they mean. Um, so to answer this question, I suggest, and I do so because I'm a literary historian, uh, that we need to turn more fully to the literary world. Uh, to the stories that were told about the stethoscope and the way that it was described and represented in the general culture at the time. And this is a case, I think, in which fiction expands upon and offers a slightly alternative perspective to medical history. So stethoscopes appear, albeit in passing, uh, surprisingly often in 19th century fiction. And this is testament in itself, I think, to the increasing prominence of the instrument in the cultural imaginary. Fictional patients often complain about the coldness of certain metals, uh, the weight of them being pressed against their bodies, the awkward positions they're asked to assume. Remember, those stethoscopes are all flexible, uh, and the sheer exhaustion that the examination induced. Uh, so, just a few brief examples. Uh, the narrator of Anthony Trollope's novel, The Three Clerks, elicits sympathy for young Katie Woodward by observing that. The poor girl lived beneath the stethoscope and bore all their pokings and tappings with exquisite patience. Uh, when Mary Elizabeth Braddon's Homer Sivright invites his physician to visit him more often, he adds, I suppose there'll be no necessity for any more serious examinations like this morning's, with a faint smile and a disagreeable recollection of the stethoscope. And later in Vixen, Braddon's nervous Mrs. Winstonley also complains that the London doctor tired me dreadfully with the stethoscope. A great sense of being tired and exhausted by this process, um, which I, I would suggest is part of the shock of the new uh, of this. Uh, in 1842, the editors of the famous satirical magazine Punch recognized this intrusion of the stethoscope into the medical and social operations in a sketch called Reminiscences of a Stethoscope. Uh, and it's the tale of the travels of a well shaped, good looking, portable stethoscope uh, narrated from the point of view of the instrument itself. 
So early in life, this instrument tells us it attracted the notice of one Dr. Roses in a shop on the Strand, uh, who immediately introduced it into society. And it gains the confidences of hundreds of men and women. These confidences, however, are not actually of disease uh, or of pain. They're of social habits uh, and romantic secrets. Uh, so in the case of one young girl, <clears throat> the stethoscope reports, I discovered a peculiar murmur not mentioned either by Ledeck or the lamented Dr. Hope. When her bosom heaved a sigh, I distinctly heard Henry Corbell valeting <laughs> from one air passage to another. Upon this hint, Dr. Hammer Roses spoke. The parents adopted his prescription, and I soon afterwards noticed in the library cards bearing the names Mr. Henry Corbell and Mrs. Henry Corbell. And so this is evidently a very light-hearted piece, but it is testament to, to the novelty of this medical technology and to its increasingly coming into contact with the social operations uh, of Victorian society and the ways that it's intervening in personal affairs. In so doing, it also demonstrates the ways in which social relationships are being renegotiated uh, around the physical presence of the stethoscope and these potential secrets that it might expose. Punch had fantasised about the stethoscope a year earlier uh, in a piece on the physiology of the London medical student. Uh, here it advised its readers, to keep up his character, a new man ought perpetually to carry a stethoscope, a curious instrument, something like a six-penny toy trumpet with its top knocked off, uh, and used for the purpose of hearing what people are thinking about, or something of the kind. Uh, the notion uh, that a stethoscope and by extension a physician might hear one's thoughts uh, and access the secrets of one's heart uh, moved between the kind of material and metaphoric operations of the heart and betrays a curious sense of invasion as the body becomes strangely vulnerable to this instrument. And so it issues a warning at the end, take our word when medicine arrives at such a pitch that the secrets of the human heart can be probed. It need not go any further and will have power of doing mischief enough. So the use of the stethoscope is identified here as a method of prying into medical but also into personal affairs uh, that is capable of revealing intimate secrets. It was in such a vein that Thackeray employed the stethoscope as a metaphor in his historical novel The Virginians, which is actually set before the invention of the stethoscope. Uh, but it draws on an image of intimate listening uh, from contemporary medicine when the narrator asks, Shall we play eavesdropper at twilight embrasures, count sighs and handshakes, bottle hot tears, lay our stethoscope upon delicate young breasts and hear their heart throbs? Explicitly aligning the medical practice of listening to the motion of the heart with this more ignoble practice of eavesdropping. Uh, so whatever its flaws and limitations in medical practice, and there were undoubtedly many at this time, uh, the stethoscope was betrayed with these, be bestowed with these kind of extraordinary powers of penetration in the popular imagination. <clears throat> it's clear from this, I think, that the use of the stethoscope was something of a culture shock to many patients who were made painfully aware that there was a sonic realm within their bodies uh, that they, despite uh, their best efforts, were now deaf to. Uh, and it's this concept of sounds that were only accessible to highly trained professionals that gave rise to fears of the unknown uh, and the stethoscope's ability to predict the future. As a material embodiment of the medical profession, the stethoscope became for many patients a real focal object in consultations and in later memories of those consultations. As the Blackwoods magazine observed in 1847, it was an object that had long ceased to excite merely professional interest, for there are few families to whom it has not proved an object of horror and of saddest remembrance. Reflecting upon its status as an instrument on which the hopes and fears, one might also say the destinies of mankind, so largely hang, the writer notes that it appears to present a fit subject for poetic treatment. And it was a subject of poetic treatment. So Blackwoods follows this rumination with another length of poem, some about 12 pages long, uh, directly addressing the medical object. It's called To the Stethoscope. Um, throughout, the stethoscope is referred to as a musician's trumpet, uh, a king's scepter, a prophet's source of vision, uh, and a priest's sacrificial altar. It's this kind of all-powerful, all-knowing device uh, that's entirely indifferent to human desires. Um, so as I said, it goes on for a long time, but just to give you a taste of it, uh, this is the first stanza. Uh, stethoscope, thou simple tube, the clarion of the yawning tube, Unto me thou seems to be a very trump of doom. 
my Trump and Doom f uh, blog got picked up a lot when I wrote about this passage after the <laughs> set of events. Um, Wielding thee, the grave physician by the trembling patient stands, like some deftly skilled musician. Strange, the trumpet in his hands, whilst the sufferer's eyeball glistens, full of hope and full of fear. Quietly he bends and listens with his quick, accustomed ear. Waiteth until thou shalt tell tidings of the war within. In the battle, in the strife, is it death or is it life that the fought for prize shall win? Um, what's interesting here is the authority in this diagnosis is actually given to the stethoscope and not to the doctor who's interpreting the sounds. And it, it's become this sort of uh, oracle in and of itself. This idea that this is a battle being waged inside the human body that the sufferer can't even hear and isn't privy to. And the stethoscope is this kind of interface uh, on the threshold between life and death uh, and between hope and horror. It's far from unusual for new technologies to be described as magical, or wonderful, or frightful uh, by their first users. But the association of the stethoscope with kind of strange supernatural happenings marks a deeper cultural fascination with that potentially distressing intimate knowledge of one's own body which lay beyond the limits of auditory perception. Well, a, do a doctor writing to the London Medical Gazette might insist that the authority conveyed by the stethoscope had a remarkable ability to soothe the patient uh, if the physician let him once feel its soft and gentle touch, stealing over the seat of decay and by a sort of magic influence drawing to itself the venom that lurks within. Again, this idea of the stethoscope having the power of drawing the disease out of the body. Um, his extraordinary image of the stethoscope as this kind of enchanted healer was certainly not shared by everyone. Uh, more often, it provoked distress. Uh, when in Sheridan Lefanu's unfortunately titled novel, Willing to Die, uh, there were the hushed, dreadful moments while he listened thoughtfully through his stethoscope to the still small voice of fate, to us inaudible, pronouncing on the dread issues of life or death. So this was an instrument of ordeal. Uh, as the narrator of Brannan's All Along the River observes, it thrills us all with the aching pain of fear when we see it in the doctor's hand. And given that such sensations as horror, dread, and insight into the unknown are staples of Victorian sensation and Gothic fiction, it's not surprising that the medical facts and cultural anxieties surrounding the stethoscope provided a site uh, for the medical and the imaginative to disrupt and inform one another in these kind of fictional explorations of the stethoscope. In the opening scenes of Lefany's Gothic novel Uncle Silas, for example, the heroine Maud interrupts her father in his study. She says, my father was sitting in his chair with his coat and waistcoat off, uh, Mr. Beerley kneeling on a stool beside him rather facing him, his black scratch wig leaning close to my father's grizzled hair. There was a large tome of their divinity lore, I suppose, open on the table close by. The lank black figure of Mr. Beerley stood up and he concealed something quickly in the breast of his coat. Though her father orders Maud from the room, it's clear to the reader uh, that he's anxious his daughter has discovered the truth of his ailing medical condition. Beely's been leaning forward, listening to his patient's chest, and we presume he's hiding his stethoscope when Maud enters. Maud, however, is entirely confused by what she's seen, and she believes that they're engaged in a cult of worship. Uh, her conflation of the physician, though, with a, with a lank high priest in black, and of her father as a penitent sinner, Confessing to this man in black, though erroneous, nonetheless replicates this new inescapable hierarchy uh, of the doctor-patient relationship, as well as the sense of power that's being bestowed upon the physician uh, because of his new medical knowledge. The Maud's father is not confessing his sins to a priest. His body is revealing its physical condition to a skilled auscultator. An exchange of information inaudible to the naked ear is taking place, and he looks to his physician. Uh, in a way that one might have previously looked to a priest for insight into his future. So here the medical professional exerts a new form of power over life and death, one which is awe-inspiring and potentially haunting as that inspired by religious institutions. So there are many other Gothic stethoscopes in this period, uh, which I don't have time to explore here, sadly, uh, but it is worth noting that the stethoscope does appear a bit briefly uh, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, when Van Helsing uses a stethoscope in his examination of the beautiful young Lucy. Uh, and I find this one particularly interesting because Dracula is a novel that really celebrates the achievements of modernity. It's filled with blood transfusions, with railway travel, with phonographs, with telegraphs, telephones, railway travel, and so on. 
Uh, but at this point, it also seems to note the limits of modern science when confronted with the mysteries of life, like vampires. Uh, but the stethoscope doesn't, in this instance, reveal what's happening in Lucy's body. It reveals a very faint heartbeat, uh, but not a pathological cause for it. Uh, Count Dracula's infiltration of her body is apparently a more insidious form uh, of invasion that's more subtle even than the stethoscope can achieve. But I think such responses to the stethoscope interweave interesting traditions of magic, science, and religion uh, in order to inculcate this popular sense of mystery and power in the object, which blurs the boundaries between magical phenomena and scientific possibilities, even while celebrating the advance of science and new technologies. The stethoscope offers a kind of mystical communication between doctor and patient, a patient's body. It presents a delicate balance between science and mystery and its ability to foretell the future and the hitherto unknown. And clearly beyond the medical profession itself, <coughs> this new way of listening <coughs> excuse me, emphasised more broadly the limitations of the unassisted ear, unable to hear the war within. Um, and it prompted the construction of new narratives, stories, metaphors about the vulnerability of that body, whose inner emotions might now be exposed to a third party in the figure of the 